the Grand Dialogue established in 2005 with a small Templeton grant, and our speaker has had major Templeton grants, and uh, we're all collectively very appreciative of what the Templeton Foundation has done for bringing together not only science and religion, but also now some of the different faith perspectives uh, on this issue. But their Grand Island was formed with a coalition of 10 colleges, seminaries, and organizations. You'll see them in the program that, that got this started. And we've had uh, about 12 dialogues up to this point. And we've had uh, uh, quite a, a mixture. We've had people from psychology, biology, physiology, um, philosophy, and of course, and geology, anthropology. And we've had different faith groups represented. We've had Buddhist speakers, we've had Orthodox Jews, we've had Muslims, atheists, Protestant, and Catholic Christians. So I said, it's, as we say in, in our uh, founding, we are interinstitutional, <coughs> interdisciplinary, and interfaith in our approach to science and religion. We are not promoting a particular faith or a particular view, but we're providing a forum for those ideas to be presented and come forward. Our commitment is to do it in a manner that's respectful and open to new ideas and, and new thoughts that we can pursue. So I'm very happy to uh, introduce also the Senior Research Associate at the Kaufman Review Institute, Kelly Clark, who has worked with our speaker and will give the introduction for us at this point. I did, in order to prepare for this, I did what I think everybody should do if you want to find out about something or someone, um, and that is do a Google search. And I found out something I didn't know. I've known uh, Christian for a long time, but I did a Google search, and I found out that Christian Miller is a powerful and explosive linebacker for the University of Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> Christian, roll tide. <laughs> Evidently, in addition to being a scholar athlete, he also has a really high GPA in philosophy. Um, and uh, how do I know this? Because he's the uh, AC Reed Professor of Philosophy at Wake Forest University. He's received nearly $10 million in grants from the Templeton Foundation uh, for the study of character. And, oh, I meant to bring up the book. Would you mind holding that book up behind you? Um, we at Grand Valley have been studying um, his popular book, on uh, moral character for the past year, and many people were able to eat dinner with him last night and talk about the book. We're grateful for that. He's also written scholarly books on the topic, published with Oxford University Press, Moral Character and Empirical Theory in Character and Moral Psychology. If you want to dig deeper into the subjects, I definitely remember uh, I recommend taking a look at those books. Uh, I met Christian, a number of years ago in Athens, we spent almost two weeks together, I think, directing a workshop for Chinese scholars on um, the top topics related to this book. We had a great time together and talked a lot about uh, virtue and character and how to develop virtue and character. And uh, we've only had email contact since then. We spent some time in China, but since then we've, we've only had email contact since then. So I'm just dying to know uh, he had just gotten married when I met him in Athens, and he had no children when um, he was in, well, none that, I, that you were talking about anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and um, now he's been married a long time, and he has two children? Right. Two children. And I think there's no better way to develop character, or not, <laughs> than to be married and have children. So I'd just like you to talk a little bit maybe about your moral progress in the past few years. <laughs> Please welcome Christian Miller. Okay. Does that put some pressure on me? He seems that there has been more progress. Uh, this year? Let's see, can you hear me okay? Is this working well? In the back? Thumbs up? Yes, good. See the slides okay in the back? Also, good. Excellent, thumbs up, good. Two thumbs up already. So, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Come on. Come on. Let's try it again. Everyone. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Okay, very nice to see you. 
Thank you so much for inviting me to be here. It's a real honor. Thank you to Doug and Kelly and everyone who's involved in organizing this visit. I'm just uh, really humbled to have this opportunity to share some of my recent ideas about character as expressed in this book, The Character Gap, with you. Get to your feedback here from the commentators, have a really nice discussion, and potentially change my, change my views so, and, and refine my views and, and think more about this really crucially important topic together with you. So my plan is to speak for about 45 or 50 minutes and then sit down and hear from the two commentators and then hear from you afterwards. I think that's, that's our plan for, for this morning. To, uh, to get started, I want to direct you to a website where uh, this is the character project we've been directing at Wake Forest for a number of years. If you're interested in this topic, you want to learn more about what we're doing back in Wake Forest, I encourage you to come check it out. We have videos, we have links to research, and all kinds of interesting uh, scholarly work that we're doing there. But to really get us started this morning, I want to begin with a story I use at the beginning of my book. It's about this person, Walter Vance. And I'm beginning with this story because I really think it conveys the seriousness of what we're talking about with character. This is not just an academic discussion we're having. We're going to you know, uh, debate this for a little while as philosophers and theologians and so forth. They go home and as if it doesn't really matter in our real lives. No, this really is an important, crucially important topic. And I want to reinforce that with this story. So this person lived in West Virginia. It was Thanksgiving. It was actually Black Friday. He was at a local Target shopping for some decorations for his store. He was so excited about Christmas this year, he wanted everyone to enjoy the holiday he loved so much. Unfortunately, he had a heart condition. And that particular day, he, uh, his heart gave out, he collapsed to the floor, and there he was lying motionless in an aisle in Target. What would you do if you had seen someone like this collapse in an aisle? I suspect you would say, I, I would run over and help. I would do something, I'd pull my phone, I'd call 911, whatever it would be, I would do something to help. Well, it turns out in this particular store, on that particular day, no one did anything to help for a long time. People would see him on the floor, and they'd turn around and go the other direction. Or in some cases, they would actually step over his body in order to get to that TV or whatever it was that they really desperately wanted. It was only after a number of minutes that finally a nurse came along, saw his body, tried to administer CPR, called for the ambulance. The ambulance came, and on the way to the hospital, he passed away. So would he have survived if someone had intervened earlier? We don't know for sure, but at least the odds would have been better. That's a reflection of bad character, I would say. That was a really terrible, tragic event that might have been prevented if people had exhibited better character. Now, that might have just been specific to that particular store, those particular shoppers, or it might teach us a deeper lesson about one of the obstacles to developing good character that's in all of us. And I'll wait and see how that unfolds as we go on the talk and suggest that what happened in that store might not be so unique. It might actually be showing us something deep and important about all of us in our psychology. So the point there was to convey this is a really important discussion. Lives matter, and uh, 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 of course lives matter, but uh, life and death might be at stake in a really dramatic forms here when it comes to character. So with that in mind, here's the plan for this morning. First, I want to talk about what is character. I'm a philosopher. I think we've got to define our terms. We've got to be clear what we mean. Otherwise, we're going to talk right past each other. So I'll start there. Then I'll turn to psychology to give us some insight about how good or bad we are. And then finally, I'll look at trying to improve character. So given how good we actually are or bad, and how good we should be, how can we bridge this gap between the two in order to try and develop a better character? We'll look at first some secular strategies for doing that. And then I'll end with some specifically Christian strategies for improving character. So, ambitious, a lot to get to. Are we ready? Yes. All right, let's get to it. First, the definition. I'll need your help here uh, for a couple of these questions. I'm going to start with an assumption about character. I'm going to say good moral character. I'm going to look at moral character specifically. The good side of moral character has to do with virtues. So, if someone give me an example of a virtue, you get a shout out. Honesty. Honesty, good. Okay, give me another one. Courage. Courage. Okay, give me another one. Kindness. Kindness. Humility. Generosity. So temperance, fortitude, etc. So there are plenty of examples of virtues and also, sadly, of vices. Bad moral character has to do with the moral vices. Shout out of moral vice. Lying. Greed. 
What's the other one? Sloth. 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 Okay, yes, 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 sorry. Right. Here's my great gun. Avarice. Dishonesty. Take every virtue and flip it and you get a vice, okay? So there are plenty of examples of virtues, plenty of examples of vices. I think that's a familiar good starting point. But it really just raises the question, well, okay, character, good character, virtues, what's a virtue? How do we understand that? Backs the question up one level. I'll, instead of giving you a really abstract definition to start with, although I'd like to do that as a philosopher, it might not be the best way to go, let's use an example to try and unpack what a virtue is. So, take a passion, and let me give you this question. If someone picks up some job papers only once, is that sufficient for being a compassionate person? No. Yes, right? No, come on, come on, come on. No, right? No, no, obviously, easy question. What's missing here? Picks up some job papers only once. Consistency, very good, yes. You better do it more than once if you're going to be a compassionate person. One time is not enough. It's a good thing, but it's clearly not enough. Sometimes there needs to be some frequency or consistency to one's helping. So let's add that. If someone frequently helps, but only when it comes to picking up job papers, is that sufficient for being a compassionate person? No. no, thank you. Good. That was much better at the time. Um, what's missing here? Breath. 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 I like that word. Yeah, breath. Very good word. Uh, another kind of consistency. This time, consistency across situations. Clearly, it's nice to pick up job papers, but that's not all there is to being a compassionate person. So it looks like there needs to be some diversity across situational consistency or breadth to one's helping. So let's add that in there to the equation. If someone is being reliably helpful in various situations, so we, we're now thinking that way, but only for purely self-serving reasons like making a good impression on your significant other or putting yourself in a good mood, is that sufficient for being compassionate? No. No, wow, we got it. Wow, look at that. We're really going down. We're really going down. Um, no. Why? Motivation is not matters to character as well as behavior. You need to have the right kind of motivation as well as the right kind of behavior in order to be a virtuous person. In order to act well, it's okay just to behave a certain way. But to be a good person, to be a virtuous person, more is involved. Looks like one needs to have some good motivation and virtuous reasons behind, in this case, one's helping. Okay, so let's summarize that and now give us the abstract, more general characterization of a virtue. And you know, a moral virtue looks like it leads to behavior that is morally admirable. Uh, right, that's obvious. In a diverse range of situations relevant to the virtue, we talked about that, it can't just be picking up and drop papers. Stably over time, it can't just be today, Better be tomorrow, the next day, next week, next year, and so forth. And finally, primarily for good and admirable reasons and motives, and especially not crudely self-interested reasons and motives. Does that make sense? Is that, is that clear enough? There, is this all there is to having a virtue? Probably not. Probably there's more that needs to be added, but I think this will do the job for today. It'll be a good starting point for us. How about advice? Well, you can take the same framework and just Reverse it or flip it. Instead of saying morally admirable, you say morally just admirable, horrible, bad. Uh, instead of primarily for good and admirable reasons and motives, you would say the opposite. Okay, so you can actually import this right over to a vice as well. All right, so that was the philosophy. We got that out of the way. Um, those who are not inclined towards philosophy, let's largely go. Let's go into some more empirical uh, side of this discussion with looking at some psychology. Because now we come to part two. How good is our character? I'm going to understand that like we just did in terms of how virtuous is our character. Or in other words, do we tend to have the virtues? Now for something like this, I can't as a philosopher just sit in my armchair and think, what's the answer? I'd like to. I'd like to figure out all questions from my armchair in my office uh, just by thinking really hard. But that's not really something I can figure out without any data. I need some empirical facts to help me sort through these questions. And when I've looked at the empirical data, I've come to an answer. And I've been doing this for many years and looking at a lot of data. Here's my answer. And fortunately, I'm, it's not very positive. Sorry, I'm warning you in advance. 
This is the depressing part of the talk. Uh, I don't know if you knew this coming in or you're expecting this, but <clears throat> what most of us today is not virtuous at all. In other words, most of us today do not have any of the moral virtues. That's a real downer. I, you can leave now if you want to. I understand. I won't be offended. Um, now, notice a couple of things about that. Most of us, I'm not saying all people. Oh, there goes someone. Um, <laughs> excuse me. Um, so, I'm not saying everyone. I think there's a bell curve here, and there are outliers. And so, in the, the cover of the book, we've got a spectrum here. And there, there, there are people like Gandhi, there are people like Jesus, there are people like Abraham Lincoln, and so forth, and Harry, Harry Tubman on one end. So, I'm not saying all. Uh, us here is going to be Westerners, because a lot of data involves Western populations. And notice this today, it's not saying what's true about 100 years ago or 1,000 years ago. So this is actually more qualified and nuanced than it might look. Why did I come to that conclusion? Well, there are a number of ways you might uh, think the same way as I do here. You might look at the teachings of different religions. And a lot of religions would actually say this. Uh, you might look at human history. Lots of not so encouraging developments in human history. You might look at the news today. That would actually be easy to support that and look at the news today. Just look at, look at this week, for example. But I wanted something that was more systematic. Something that would put people in very specific situations and see how they would behave when a moral temptation uh, arose or immoral temptation arose. So would they cheat or not? Would they lie or not? Would they steal or not? Would they help or not? Would they harm or not? So do that very carefully and systematically and see what the results would be. And where can I go for that? Psychology, right? Experiments in personality and especially social psychology would give me some helpful evidence, I thought, to determine the extent to which people are virtuous, vicious, or something else. Does that make sense? So that's my primary source of evidence for my conclusion here. There's no way I can try and summarize all that evidence today. You were, I guess I could try, but I don't think you would want me to. Right? It'll take hours. I looked at hundreds of studies going back to the 1950s. There's a lot of research to draw from. So what instead I'll do is just give you a little sampling. I'll give you two illustrations to help hopefully contextualize and explain why I came to this conclusion. Okay, deal? Now, you're gonna think, <coughs> I'll say this up front, wow. Two, two studies, and he drew this big conclusion? Oh boy, that's really bad. Right? Don't think that, okay? I've read a lot more studies than these. These are just two examples of many. So please understand that. I'm giving you just illustrations. The first one is an old one, a classic in the history of psychology, 1969. If you're familiar with the bystander effect or the group effects, it's becoming a kind of popular discourse these days. Uh, this is one of the studies that got us on that path. So here's the idea. You're a participant, you sign up for a study, you're told that you're gonna be filling out a survey. You come into the room, you sit down, you're given a survey and a pen. You're, you're, you're said, you know, thanks for doing this. The person in charge leaves and you work away at your survey. A few minutes later, a stranger comes in with the same person in charge, is given a survey, sits down at the table with you. So there are two people in the room, you and a stranger, and you're both working on your surveys. Right? Clear? So far? Then, more time elapses, you're working at your job, and this is the next thing you hear. That person in charge has gone to the next room. And if they were listening carefully, participants heard her climb on a chair to get a book from the top shelf. Even if they were not listening carefully, they heard a loud crash, and a woman scream as the chair fell over. Oh my God, my foot, cried a representative. I can't move it. Oh my ankle, I can't get this thing off me. Wow. What would you do? You would help, wouldn't you? Yeah. What, do you what would you expect most people would do? Yeah, yeah right, help. And when most people, you know, whatever year it is, 1969 or today, they would do something to help. Well, it turns out it depends. Suppose that the participant is in the room with another survey taker and this other person does not respond to the crash. Okay? So that's you or the participant and the other person there is continuing to fill out the survey not doing anything to respond. Would that make a difference? Well, first of all, should it make a difference? No. 
would it make a difference? Well, I kind of primed you already to expect that it's going to make a difference, right? Otherwise, I wouldn't give you the study. But, you know, ordinarily, you probably wouldn't think it would, right? If you don't know anything about history, psychology, then, look, that's irrelevant. I would help. Other people would help, even if the other person's not doing anything. <coughs> wow. 7% helped in that situation. That means 93% did not do anything to help. Even when there's a, there's a clear emergency going on in the next room. Okay. And uh, just to make sure that it's to reinforce the point that it was a clear emergency, in another variation of the study where there was no stranger with the participants, and in the same emergency happened, 70% of participants helped in that scenario. So it was clearly the stranger was making a big difference as to whether helping happened or not. Okay. 70% versus 7%. This has been replicated many times, this version and other versions of it, similar versions here in the man having a seizure. The maintenance worker fall off a ladder in another room. The man crying out pain from electric shock. Smoke coming into the room. <laughs> Imagine smoke is coming in through here, and I'm just continuing the lecture and I like to see it, but I'm still like doing anything. You all probably would hang up, just pretend like nothing's happening. <laughs> Strange. <laughs> Watching a thief seal cash from a receptionist's envelope. Uh, case of beer being stolen, and even a bully beat up a child. Perhaps the most disturbing one of all. Okay, so go back to the beginning of the, of the talk. Walter Vance, right? In that uh, Target on Black Friday. A real life illustration of precisely what's going on in this research. There was a group of people all around. No one was doing anything. So therefore, individual shoppers didn't do anything either, while this person was dying on the floor. That's a <clears throat> showing this is not just relegated to the lab or an artifact of an artificial environment in a, in a psychology experiment, but actually plays out in the real world. Not so admirable either, right? Kind of uh, not a great illustration of uh, virtue. OK, so that's my first example. Here's my second one. More updated, more contemporary, 2011, Lisa Shu. This is moving from helping, excuse me, to cheating. So a different elements or aspect of morality. Helping in the first one, or lack of helping. Now we're gonna to go to cheating or uh, honesty. So in her study, each participant completed a worksheet with 20 problems. Paid 50 cents per correct answer. In the control condition, participants do the experiment, check the answers, and oversaw payments. In other words, you took the test, you worked as hard as you could, you turned it in, and you got paid according to how well you did. No opportunity to cheat. Straightforward, okay? Clear? <clears throat> Here's the interesting one. A different group of participants, right? this is not so clear from the slide, but a different group of participants were put into a shredder condition, where same test, same monetary incentive, <clears throat> they completed it, but this time they got to grade it their answers, and destroy all their materials, and verbally report how well they did. <clears throat> Quote unquote, how well they did, right? So it's up to them uh, to say exactly how many they got right, whether that was the truth or an exaggeration. Is that clear? Right? So that's not, probably not the shredder they actually used, but that's an illustration of a shredder. Not, not that we needed one. <clears throat> um, here's no opportunity to cheat. The baseline, the control. So what happened in this one to give us our baseline? But eight problems answered correctly on average. What do you think is gonna happen in a shredder condition? About eight as well? Maybe nine? What do you think? 18. A lot higher? Well, I mean, presumably there's gonna be something going on here again, otherwise I wouldn't show it to you. Uh, how many people think it's going to be greater than 10? Many people think it's going to be less than 10. Okay, so yeah, I kind of primed you. I've already set you up. It's not really a fair question to ask at this point. 13.22 problems answered correctly. So about double. Now, answered correctly, I should put that in scare quotes, right? Is it possible that this group was just so much smarter and just was great at doing this test? That's possible, isn't it? Theoretically, that's possible. 
Do you want to wager any money on that? Are you a betting person? You think that's the most likely explanation? Can you think of a better explanation? I can think of a better explanation as well, right? They saw an opportunity to cheat. In this scenario, they knew they could cheat and get away with it, no questions asked, and they took advantage of that opportunity. Find the question, why didn't they go all the way to 20? If they're willing to cheat, which it seems like they are, why not cheat all the way? It gets much so, so hold that, uh, we'll uh, turn to Q&A. If you want to talk about that, I, I, I got a lot of uh, things I can say and we can talk, a really fun discussion about that. So this is an interesting question to pose to you. So here we go. Is this so encouraging either when it comes to moral character? No, I don't think it is. And there's been variations of this. It's not the only version of this too. It's been uh, really a popular way to think about moral ca uh, character, specifically honesty in psychology, tested over and over again. So, uh, but quick aside, quite relevant, obviously, this week, given the huge cheating scandal that we are all aware of, that also sadly impacted my own university, which is one of the eight schools named in the cheating scandal. So, uh, has special significance this week, including to me. Uh, all right, those are my two examples. I read hundreds of studies like this in moral psychology, and I conclude the expert on this does not show the patterns of virtuous behavior and virtuous motivation. That's really crucial, too, that I would expect if we were virtuous people. So I conclude that most of us are not good people. And I work at the, have this in a lot of detail in the two books that Kelly mentioned earlier. These are academic books from 2013 2014. They have nothing to do with animals, um, and not about zebras and elephants. That's actually my mother's artwork. So I just took the opportunity to feature her artwork, even though it had nothing to do really with the books. <laughs> I only teach ethics. I don't claim to be an ethical person myself. I'm, I'm one of the people who's not vicious. I mean, so, is not virtuous, maybe I'm ambitious, but I'm not virtuous either. So I just took advantage of that opportunity. So that's actually my mother's artwork. And I'm very proud, of, very proud of her. So there we go. <laughs> this leads to what I call a character gap. And hence the title of the popular book that was mentioned earlier. I think there's a big, a significant gap between our actual character down here, which is disclosed in the psychological research, and the virtuous character which we began our time with talking about, the character we should have. This is how we actually are, this is how we should be, and there's a significant gap between the two. Hence the name of the book, The Character Gap. All right. So, that's part one, that's part two. Now, strategies for improvement. Are we hanging in there? Doing okay? How are we on the time? I can't see in the back. Okay, it looks like we're good on the time. So, I could stop right there and say, hey, we're not good. Nice to meet you. I'm heading back to North Carolina. Have a good rest of your day. Sorry. I could say, character is fixed. We're not good. There's nothing we can do about it. Good luck. That would be really awful of me to do, I think, though. So here's now a more optimistic story. Here's now more encouragement to end our time together, at least with my, with my presentation. First of all, character is not fixed. It's not stuck in cement. What kind of character you have now can change over time. Of course, in a good direction or in a bad direction. There's no guarantee it's always going to go in a good direction, but it's malleable. Now, it's not easily malleable. You can't change it overnight. You still have to snap on your finger normally without maybe, we were talking about supernatural intervention if you like, but uh, normally the way it happens is it slowly, gradually changes over time. But that gives us some optimism, some hope, right? That it can be improved in our lives, in the lives of our children, in the lives of our friends and family members. Secondly, more optimism. There look like there are some strategies that would actually help us do that. So we're not kind of left on our own to come up with you know, uh, uh, ways to fix our character with no guidance at all. It looks like there are some promising strategies to help us go down a good path. And so that's what I want to end with uh, this morning. So what I'm going to divide up is first some secular strategies, obviously. These are ones where if you're religious or not, it doesn't matter. Anyone can make use of them. And then uh, uh, as you saw, I'll end with some specifically Christian strategies. So I'll give you two. There are more than these in the book I talk about. Uh, 
seven, I think. I think seven different strategies. But I'll just give you two in the interest of time. Well, the first one has to do with finding good role models. <clears throat> we all know who that is. I don't know who that is. Maybe don't know who that is. This is, unless you've already read the book, this is probably uh, somebody who's not very well known. His name's Leopold Socha. During World War II, he was in charge of a sewer system in a small town in Poland that was invaded by the Nazis. During the invasion, he was able to get 20 Jews down, <coughs> excuse me, down into the sewer system and hide them before they could be captured by the Nazis. And for the next year and a half, he protected those Jews and kept them alive while the Nazis were literally overhead, overhead occupying the town. So I think about that, a year and a half keeping 20 people alive in a sewer system during the Nazi occupation. Which meant that every day he had to crawl on his hands and knees through the filth of the sewer system to bring that bread and water and you know, other things they needed. That's an incredible, it's an incredible story. I'd be happy to share uh, you know, a, a reference to a book if you want to read more about his life. But I really want to feature him too as, uh, as a powerful role model that people might not be familiar with. So they're famous role models, they're not as well-known role models. And he's an example of someone I think who should be more well-known. Here's the basic idea though, as far as character improvement is concerned. These are people, and there are many others, who we can admire for their good characters. So we can, we can seek them out, we can find them, and we can admire their good characters, but that's not enough. Admiration is one thing. When we admire them, we can also want to emulate them, become more like them, have our character better reflect their character. So not bring them down to our level, but try to raise our level up to theirs. Elevate our character so that it matches theirs. Not everybody, of course. Right? You don't have to come to the United States, right? You don't have to be in charge of a sewer system, but in the ways that really matter, morally speaking, the ways in which they shine forth as beacons of moral excellence. All right, so that hopefully makes sense. There's some empirical support for this. Uh, uh, role models can be role models of bad action, and they can also be role models of good action, so I'll give you an example of both. Here's a, a role model of bad action. Going back to that shredder condition again, a different variation of the shredder condition. Cheating, but now look, when a stranger was observed to cheat first, okay, so that's a new wrinkle, but not so surprising. But now that goes, it gets even more interesting. It increased dramatically when a stranger was observed to cheat and participants knew beforehand that they shared the same birthday <laughs> as the stranger. What? <laughs> what in the world? That's kind of crazy, isn't it? But nevertheless, that's what they found. Uh, so there's a kind of role model in the opposite direction that did not encourage you to good behavior. Here's uh, the flip side using, I, I like to go back to some of the earlier studies. So going now back to the bystander effect, the group effect. Here, two people heard a crash and next to them cries of, oh my foot damn, I think it's broken, oh Jesus, it hurts, ow, ow, ow. So the same kind of set up a little later in 1984. Helping was rated as 6 out of 10 when a stranger did nothing. So there was a secret observation of the participants, and they were rated how helpful were they when a, when a stranger in the room did nothing. 6 out of 10. But when a stranger acted quickly to help, participants likely helped a lot themselves too. They were rated 9 out of 10. So here's an example, a role model who kind of paved the way, showed the right way, what the right thing to do was, and that inspired others to follow that example. So a little bit of empirical support too. Um, uh, in the interest of time, um, I think I'll skip the questions. Um, just, we can, we can ask all kinds of questions later if you like, but I wanna make sure we, we have enough time for everything to still come. So let me give you the second strategy. So I said two secular strategies. Notice the first one, you don't have to be religious at all to use that strategy. Everyone uh, it's, uh, can seek out and find and emulate role models. Same thing with this one. I call it getting the word out. And this is basically just educating ourselves about the psychological impediments to virtue within our own minds. So 
So these surprising psychological tendencies, we have to do more of the problematic and more of the admirable things. Let's learn more about that so we can become uh, better equipped to counteract them, to adjust our behavior against them, to work against them. So we can be more mindful when in situations in which they might be activated and work to compensate, correct, or in the case of the good ones, encourage them. Okay, so this is basically uh, self-reflection and education about our own minds and our own characters in order to try and improve them more. So that's pretty abstract, I'm sorry, I'm sorry about that. Let me give you an example to try and make it a little bit more clear and intuitive about what's going on here. Go back to the bystander effect. <clears throat> Remember, not many people tend to help in groups when no one else is helping. How can we work to counteract that in everyone, and in, especially in myself? How can I work to improve myself so that I know if I'm ever in a group, that won't happen to me. I'll step up, I'll do the right thing. I won't just kind of blend into the crowd. Well, these researchers in 1978 thought maybe teaching people about this, learning about it, becoming more aware of it, would actually work to counteract it. So what they did was they gave students a lecture explaining how this whole thing works, making them familiar with this phenomenon. And then later that day, lo and behold, there was an emergency. Not that morning. This is in the morning lecture happened. Later that day, there was this emergency that happened. Now, of course, the students didn't know that it was all rigged, but it was. It was staged. And the experimenters wanted to see, did their lecture make any difference? Well, in order to do that, they had better have a control group, which didn't get the lecture. And then another group, which didn't get the lecture. And then see how both groups responded to that emergency. Here's how it was. The group that got the lecture, 67% helped, and only 27% of the controls who did not get the lecture helped. That's pretty stunning, isn't it? That's a pretty stark difference. Now, a couple of qualifications now. First of all, we'd like to see it replicated. We know that there's some, some questions about replication these days in psychology. We want to see this done over and over again. Also, it was the same day. So not as surprising, I mean, you go to the lecture this morning, oh, lo and behold, you go to the lecture this morning, right? You all, later this afternoon, hopefully it's still fresh in your mind, I hope. Um, so not so surprising, it might have an impact. What about down the road? Well, these researchers were quite clever here. They also thought uh, it'd be interesting to test if the effect lasted. So they did a second study. Two weeks later, would the effect still linger? What do you think? What's your guess? Less. Less, but, but still, yeah. still in effect? Okay. And so, you would be right. Less, but still in effect. 0.2% okay. versus 25% tw two weeks later. My reaction to this is, that's really impressive. And I'm a professor. If my lectures had that impact two weeks later, I, I would be thrilled, right? I'd be jumping up and down. And yeah, of course, it's not 100%, but that's a significant difference two weeks later. But my students can't remember my lectures the next class. Like, you know, I start by saying, someone remind us what we talked about last class, and there's like silence. <laughs> come on, come on. So two weeks later, I would take that any day. So that's the idea of the second strategy, is to learn about some of these impediments and obstacles to virtue, so therefore we can be more mindful of them and work to counteract them. Okay. Is that clear? Does that make sense? All right. So you can ask some questions about that if you like, um, but I will pass over that for now. I'll leave you instead with two questions about this uh, secular strategies idea. Do either of these sound promising to you? Or both? Or neither? So what, what's your reaction? to these two strategies, and are there other ones besides these that could be added to the list? I think the answer is yes. I can't cover all of them here, and I'll tell you, I'd be interested to hear what you have to say as far as other strategies for encouraging virtue besides these two. All right, last 
thing for today. My voice is uh, a little shaky. So, excuse me. <clears throat> Let's shift from secular to religious, and specifically Christian strategies. Now, when I say this, I want to be real clear up front about what I am doing here. Because I don't want to be misinterpreted. There's been a fair amount of discussion in, the, in various blogs and so forth about this. When I talk about this, this idea of uh, Christian strategies. I'm not, first of all, saying that Christianity has the only, is the only religion that has anything to teach us about character. So everyone hear me? Am I clear? Not saying that. I'm not saying that uh, one has to be a Christian in order to be a good person. Everyone hear me loud and clear by that? Uh, you can be a member of plenty of other religions or not religious at all and be a perfectly good person. So I want to be very clear about that. On Thursday night, I was at the University of Delaware and we were having a discussion there to a, a bunch of students about the question, can you be a good person without God? And so I was saying, yes, you can. You can't be a good person without God. So I want to be making it very clear. I'm not making any claims that I think would be untenable like this. So uh, just to reinforce it again, I'm not arguing that it's the only religion, which is capable of loss of virtue. <laughs> I'm not arguing that one has to be a Christian or need religious law to become virtuous. What I am arguing though is that Christianity has some interesting ideas to offer that are worth taking seriously. And I think that's true of many other religions as well. So in the book, The Character Gap, I devoted nine chapters to kind of secular discussion of Character, and then I had the last chapter on a Christian discussion. And it's, I did it that way because I thought, well, I could also try and do a real quick overview of all the different religions because I think they have lots to offer as well. But that would be so superficial if I spent two pages on Islam, I spent two pages on Hinduism, I spent two pages on Confucianism, two pages on Judaism. It would be so superficial that I thought it would be pretty much worthless. So instead, what I want to do is dive a little deeper into one major world religion, see what it has to offer, and then also note that there are analogs, parallels of those ideas in many other religions too. Okay, so that was my that was my approach, and I hope hopefully that makes sense and it was a reasonable approach to take. So, uh, you know, I'm guided by the thought that throughout history, the majority of people have been religious in one way or other. And all the major world religions talk about character. And have a lot to say about character. And it would be a shame to not appreciate that and delve into them and learn from them and try and take away some really good lessons from those religions. So that's what I want to end with here in the case of Christianity. Does that make sense? Is that clear? <laughs> okay. So I'll focus specifically on three ideas. Here's the first one. Christian rituals and practices can both direct attention towards good moral considerations and orientate a person's motives in the right way to respond to them. In other words, Christian rituals and practices can be conducive towards fostering virtue, can help us become better people. What do I mean by rituals and practices? I'll give you some examples. Praying, <coughs> contemplating scripture, fasting, confessing sins, tithing, ministering to the poor and needy. I'm guessing with this audience I don't need to Expand on those, depends on the audience sometimes. Uh, uh, people don't know what tithing is or fasting, but I'm, I'm guessing I'm okay here, right? Thumbs up? Yeah, okay. So, <clears throat> the idea is engaging in these kind of practices, not once, but ritually over time, over weeks, months, years, can gradually foster virtue. That's the idea. <clears throat> I didn't think that should be too strange when you think about each of these and what virtues they might foster. I'll give you a couple examples in a moment. But the, the general idea is through repeated practice, these behaviors can become automatic, like giving to the poor. It helps override temptation to act in more self-centered ways and gradually increase levels of virtue. Even if that's not the goal of these practices. So the goal of minister to the poor probably should not be to make my character better. <clears throat> so let me say it again. If you're ministering to the poor, your goal probably shouldn't be to make yourself a better person. Yeah. That's, kind of, that's kind of creepy. Right? Uh, you know, thank, you for, thank you for being poor. 
You've, you've helped me make my character better. Uh, yeah, that's that. I don't like that. But uh, the purpose of ministering to the poor is to help them, benefit, you know, improve their, uh, uh, say, um, uh, financial situation. This is, this is. But as a byproduct, a side effect of doing that, one can in the process also grow in generosity or in compassion. Okay? Similarly, the, the goal of praying isn't necessarily to uh, make yourself a better person. Again, that's very ego, egoistic, self-centered. The goal might be uh, for all kinds of other things, but a byproduct could be becoming a better person. Let's make that even more concrete. So prayer could be relevant to combating pride, arrogance and deceit, and fostering humility, proper obedience, and love. Is that so strange? Uh, I, don't, I don't think so. That seems to make sense. Notice this need uh, just be limited to Christian prayer, of course. How the religions which emphasize prayer could see similar character improvements. <clears throat> Confessing sins. Who's this here? On the left? Yes. Sorry. Praise is right. It's the current Pope. This is a, a famous picture of uh, him having confession said with uh, an ordinary, everyday priest who's hearing the <clears throat> sins of the most influential Christian in the world today. Over here, who's that? I have no idea. Um, two ghosts maybe talk to each other, whatever. Um, I, the point is, these are just two anonymous people sharing what's going on in their lives. So the confession can take lots of different forms. It can be directly to God. It can be two friends talking to each other. It could be in a confessional booth like this. The point is, and no matter how it happens, it can be relevant to combating pride, intemperance, cowardice, excessive guilt, excessive shame, and foster humility, gratitude, temperance, courage, and forgiveness. Last example, real quick. Tithing, combating greed, selfishness, stinginess, and pride, and fostering gratitude, generosity, humility, and gentleness. Okay. That makes sense? Is that, is that clear? Uh, we're getting a little uh, towards the end of the time together, so I'll, I'll try and wrap it up fairly quickly. <coughs> Second idea. All of this could happen in a social context. In a Christian way of thinking, the Christian is not left on his or her own to try and improve with no help from anyone else. That would be a tall order if it's just you got to figure out your own character on your own. Sorry, no help is available. That's not the way it works as far as I understand typically in a Christian context. All these practices are carried out socially, in a community. I uh, put it here liturgically in a social context. <clears throat> Christians pray together. They read scripture together. They confess together and even discipline each other together. So there's all kinds of help and resources and community available. And this also is not specific to Christianity, of course. Similar ideas you can see in Judaism, you can see in Islam, and other religions too. Why does it matter? Well, in the process, Christians can benefit. They can benefit from the advice, experiences, examples, mistakes, <coughs> and warnings of others. So they can look to those who are wiser than them, who have more experience, learn from the mistakes others have made, have others point out flaws in themselves, that they don't even know are there, that they don't even recognize in their own lives, all that could be extremely beneficial to developing a better character. Okay. Uh, quick, uh, just uh, aside here. Anyone know who that is? <clears throat> Anyone? Comes out? Yeah. He's sat on the pillar. Yeah, yeah, really good. That's the guy who sat on the pillar. <coughs> excuse me. <laughs> you got it. That's the guy who sat on the pillar. There he is. So you got a pillar. Why do I bring this up? Well, so first context. An example of one of the famous desert fathers. So the, the relevance is, well, what about these famous examples from the history of Christianity? These people look like they didn't exist in a social context. They were, in fact, looks like they were trying to get rid of everyone else and be off on their own sitting on top of a pillar for year after year after year. Not so fast, even in this context, even in this case, social interaction was extremely important. So here's Simeon, he had his pillar erected, 
uh, for uh, initially it was a small one, and eventually it got bigger and bigger and bigger, and to the end, it was over 50 feet above the ground, and he would sit up there day after day. But even on the highest of his columns, Simeon was not withdrawn. By means of a ladder, which would always be erected against the side, visitors were able to ascend, and we know that he wrote letters and texts of some of which he still possess, and he instructed disciplines, disciples, I'm sorry, and he also delivered addresses to those assembled beneath. So even in one of the most famous examples of someone who was isolated, there was still lots of interaction going on with fellow Christians, and in the process, character formation was happening. All right, uh, another question at this point. Any evidence that this works? Any empirical support? I'm so, so big about the empirical. I talked about the psychology. Any data to back this up? Well, um, I would say that the right way to put it would be we don't know. We don't know for sure whether there's any hard data to suggest that these practices improve character over time. There's just some preliminary evidence. That's as, that's as far as I will be willing to put it. Preliminary evidence that it might be working. I'll give you a couple of examples in the book. I talk about a few more and in other writings I talk about even more. There are now dozens and dozens and dozens of experiments connecting measures of religiosity to other interesting things like uh, volunteering, charity, health, and so forth. I'll just give you a couple of examples here. Today, so the charity volunteering, those who attended religious services were 25% more likely to give charity than those who said they rarely <coughs> did rally or said they were not religious. 23% more likely to volunteer. And in 2008, they gave away 3.5 times more money and volunteered more than twice as much. So this is a citing this book by Brooks. Some crime and education data, a study in 2001 about uh, domestic violence. Partners reported a 48.7% decrease in domestic violence uh, when the measure here was attending religious services. And also religious involvement switching to education was associated with subsequent higher parental educational expectations, more extensive communication, math courses, who would have, who would have thought that, uh, time spent on homework, and even degree completion, as well as cutting classes. And health data as well, measures of religiosity, links to reduced rates of suicide, lower drug use, increased healthcare utilization, reduced smoking, alcohol abuse, healthier lifestyles, mental health, and even mortality rates measured in years, not weeks or months, but actually years. So uh, I don't have all the citations up here, got them in the book, or you can email me, and I'd be happy to send you citations if you want to dig into this literature a little bit more. But everyone probably sees this already. A couple of cautions about reading too much into this data. One, it's correlational. So what's the famous expression on correlations? <laughs> no, not causation, right? Everyone knows correlation is not the same thing as causation. So we don't know for sure that it's the religious practices which are doing the causal work of increasing volunteerism, or whether people who are more likely to volunteer in the first place also tend to be religious. So that's a caution. I can say a lot more about that and give you some speculations. The only caution I'll give you, though, is that improved behavior is not the same thing as improved character. What's important in character besides behavior? Motivation. Motivation. So we also need to understand something about the motivation. Why is it that people are given to the collection plate? Why are they volunteering if they're religious? What's their motivation? And if it's not the kind of virtuous motivation, then it's not going to be indicative of improved character. And so I can give you some speculation about that too, if you'd like any question and answer. I think I'm coming up on the end of the time, so let me end with my third and final idea. So, first idea was practices and rituals. That has analogs in other religions too. Second idea was social interaction. That also has analogs in other religions too. Third idea, as you see here, is something that has no analog, as far as I'm aware, in other religions, or at least not you know, an obvious analog. And that's the rule of the Holy Spirit. So Christians talk about God being a trinity, Father, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all of which are equally persons of the trinity uh, uh, and uh, part of God. So this one part, the Holy Spirit, plays a special role here. 
is supposed to play the role of improving the character of believers in Christianity. <clears throat> That's one way at least to unpack it. For it is God who works in you, inspiring both the will and the deed for his own chosen purpose. So what's the relevance of this? <clears throat> it's that, that it's not just me trying to fix my character, it's God also being active and intervening in the life of the believer to cause the influence or affect the process of character development. To use the, the lingo, sanctification in the Christian way of thinking is not humans left to their own devices, it's God working in the human as well as the human making a contribution to. <clears throat> How? The Holy Spirit may work to address the deepest recesses of a Christian's mind and weaken the effect influence of non-virtuous tendencies. So, the last picture, last image I'll leave you with is this. From a virtual perspective, God and human beings are working together throughout the long process of developing a good virtuous character. We're not left to our own devices. There's actually a friendship and a partnership and a cooperative process that's going on between the divine and the human. So that, I'll sum up and end. I mentioned five strategies for becoming more virtuous. Role models. Getting the word out, Christian rituals and practices, help from the Christian community, and help from the Holy Spirit in a Christian context here. I'll leave you with some questions. Do any of these five now strategies, we've got five on the table, sound promising to you? <clears throat> Which ones don't? Which ones sound problematic? Are there others besides these that look promising? And what might you do practically in your own life? And what might I do practically in my life? to actually make this not just academic, but very personal and real world and relevant to try and become a better person. Thanks so much for your time. I want to invite our responders to come to the table and join Christian for this next phase. respond to Christian, not only from what he said, but also from their own experience and their own research. And uh, first to respond will be Dr. Linda Ruggiero, who is a professor of psychology at Hope College and has done work in this area. And then after she <coughs> responds, uh, then we're <coughs> asking Dr. Jeffrey Barnes, who is a professor of philosophy at Illinois State University. And following that, we'll ask Christian if he wants to make some responses and we'll open up for questions and answer. You can take the mic if you want to. Oh, um, sure, if that's preferable. Or is this my team? Can, can you hear okay? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay, I'll stay here. Um, we're, this is part of the discussion. I'm so uh, pleased to be here with you this morning. I'm gonna keep my comments brief because I think the most interesting discussion is the one that we can have, um, all of us together, and the things that you brought to the table or the questions that you had following Christian's talk. Uh, but there's a couple of things I wanna comment on, and there's just maybe three main ideas I'm gonna touch on. Uh, in response to some of the things that Christian shared. The first is the power of the situation. So um, one of the things I really appreciated about what Christian talked about this morning is that the situation is powerful when it comes to what our behaviors look like, right? The examples that he gave of the bystander effect or the lady in distress, uh, the examples of um, oppor opportunities to cheat, um, that psychological research in general, far beyond just the two examples he cited, has found that the situation carries a lot more weight or predictive power in our individual responses than maybe our personality or our character traits uh, as we generally define them. Uh, and some of my own research has been in forgiveness and forgiveness seeking, which is sort of an interesting um, microcosm of virtue because it's interpersonal and it usually happens because someone has failed to be virtuous, either towards us, they've failed in their ability to kind of uphold right character, they've harmed us in some way, or perhaps we've failed and we've harmed someone else, so how are we responding to that? And when we think in the context of forgiveness, uh, we find that we're more likely to forgive close people, <coughs> so people that we're in relationship with, um, and that we're committed to, 
And also if the offense is milder, right? Really severe offenses are much harder for us to overcome and let go of, uh, and either let go of that animosity, right, that we might have towards someone who harms us um, and wish them well, which might even be the next step beyond letting go of our negative, right, um, intentions towards that person, but going beyond that to wish them good things. Uh, but what we do find is that measures of personality or character uh, are generally better at predicting behavior on average than they are in a given situation. So all of the situations that maybe social psychologists have focused on and that I think Christian focuses on in his own work reviewing this body of research focuses on a single act, right? Because that's how we can measure behavior in an observational way. But when we look across the course of someone's life, our tendencies, right, the way that we define ourselves, whether we think of ourselves as forgiving or humble, um, it is much better at predicting aggregate response. So in lots of situations, and this is exactly what Christian talked about in terms of what it means to be a virtuous person, is it has to happen over time in lots of places. And this is where we see that that variation in character seems to matter. So even if maybe we're not as good as we want to be or as good as maybe we should be, um, there is meaningful variation here. There is some places where some of us do this better than others, which does give us some hope for how to become better in our character um, and also some places to aspire, right, which is pretty meaningful. Also, if we didn't have any sense of who among us was more honest or more forgiving or more humble, how would we choose any sort of relationship partner in any way? How would any of us choose who to marry? How would any of us choose who to become friends with or associate with? How would we pick examples in our lives to help us be better people? Um, how, would us, how would we do this? Now, we're not always great at it, right? We all make mistakes in this domain, but we do have some sense um, and ability to judge one another's character and our own character, even if maybe we're not as good at it as we think we should be or would like to be. So that's the first thing, the power of the situation, and yet there's something meaningful about personality and character still at play. The second thing that I want to touch on is the power of habit and perspective. And Christian talked about this a bit in his kind of ideas about how to become better people. Um, one of the things that we find in psychological research and some of the things that I find in my own research as well as uh, anecdotally in some of my clinical practice is that the way that we think about our lives, the way that we think about other people, and how good we are at perspective taking all sort of points to our behaviors and how we're able to engage with one another. So those mental habits that we cultivate um, really allow us to work forward and become more the people maybe that we aspire to be. So um, let's, let's go to some like concrete examples. Uh, one, when we have greater empathy for others, so when we purposefully engage in perspective taking, or maybe it just automatically happens that we have good perspective taking and compassion towards others, we engage in more helping behaviors, right? That's something that's really widely found. Um, when we're reminded of our values, so if we have internal values of being honest or um, of being kind or, or committed to giving, or being generous, when we're reminded of those values, we're more likely to act in ways that are consistent with those values across situations. Maybe that's one of the things that makes that Christian community, that faith community, whatever community you're a part of so powerful, is that the people around us remind us of the values that are in front of us and help us live more fully into those ideals. Um, among, say, uh, forgiveness and forgiveness seeking, we see that empathy and guilt are really powerful predictors of these two things. So if I have empathy for my offender, I'm much more able right, to let go of that resentment, to behave in ways that are kind to them, to, um, to, to live out that virtue of forgiveness. If I believe that I'm responsible and carry some guilt for maybe the way that I've harmed others or understand the way that my offense has harmed them, I am much more better much more better. I'm much better, right, um, at, uh, at moving forward in pursuing reconciliation, right, and seeking forgiveness towards another person um, and, and moving forward in that way. When we ask people in the lab to shift their perspective, when we have them recall an offense, and then we ask them to think about that person as someone who's in need of growth and transformation, right? Developing empathy and the ability to see them as a fellow human being, right? Who makes mistakes just like you do. 
it's a lot easier us, for us to experience empathy towards them and in turn for their forgiveness than say if we ruminate about how terrible that offense was and how much it hurt us and all the ways that they wronged us. Um, and similarly, guilt is a reliable predictor, right, of seeking intention. So uh, rumination makes it more difficult both for us to forgive and seek forgiveness. So the way that we think has a meaningful impact on our behaviors. Um, and it may help us, right, uh, overcome another character gap we might talk about, which is simply the idea that I desire to be more virtuous than I am. So those mechanisms for how do I make the right decisions, um, growing our perspective taking, especially in the interpersonal virtues, seems to be a way to help us move forward in doing that. So first thing, situation and personality. Second thing, the power of our habits and our perspectives cognitively. Uh, and then the third, I would just want to talk a minute um, about sort of the, the outcomes of virtue um, beyond uh, desiring good for others and desiring um, maybe to, to live into those values or character. Uh, one of the things we find is that flourishing seems to be a side effect of virtue, right? So feeling good about myself, feeling satisfied with my life, and then also being able to engage meaningfully in relationship with others and in society seems to come out of a virtuous character. Uh, and so, as Christian talked about, wanting to be a better person is maybe not um, the best motivation for engaging in, in good acts or virtuous acts. Uh, but it does seem to be something that just kind of comes alongside with it. Uh, and we do find um, that forgiveness as an example, right, uh, underscores the positive outcome of virtue. So when people are more forgiving, um, they reduce their negative emotion, they increase positive emotion, they calm the body's stress response, right? All of these things that we would think would be really helpful happen. Is that a good reason in and of itself to forgive? I would probably argue no, right? But it is a nice side effect that comes along uh, with the work that we're doing. Um, and, and there does seem to be some research that would say that as we continue to engage in behavior, our attitudes shift along with that behavior, which is, again, going back to Christian's point in his third section of his talk, that as we continue to move forward in these behaviors, we, become, we can nudge ourselves towards being more virtuous simply by the act of living them out. However, there's some really interesting research that thinks about how when people behave autonomously or volitionally to help others or to be more virtuous, um, they're more likely one to help, help to a greater degree. So that they intend, uh, if, they if they feel that they're choosing to help, uh, they help more. So they engage in more daily helping behaviors in the lab. They, um, if they're in a, there's a, a really great study um, in particular by Weinstein and Ryan from 2010, where they ask people in the lab to actually um, sit and kind of work on some packet assembly. Not a very big deal helping task, right? But when people thought that they were choosing to be helpful, they got a lot more packets done than when they were just like, well, come on in, this is part of the study, assemble some packets, right? They're still with another person, they're still doing, but they're engaged and they're helping more. And they experience more positive benefit because they feel that they're choosing these behaviors, right? This idea that I can willfully engage in meaningful helping behaviors. So that internal motivation to help by choice that's in line with my values seems to promote better flourishing, more flourishing, more positive kind of just self-engagement. So one of my big questions is how do we help others and help ourselves orient our motives correctly? And this is a question that I think is um, just really interesting and if you all have any ideas, I'd be really interested to hear them. Uh, because I think in, in my work as a clinical psychologist as well as my work as a researcher, this continues to be a question, right? That I can, we can think about how to change the situation, we can think about how to maximize Personality, we can think about how to encourage the behavior, but really that transformation moving beyond simply engaging in the behavior to the desire, right, to be virtuous, I think is, is maybe one of the largest leaps that we have to make. Um, and I, I think it's a big question for all of us. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Miller, for his engaging talk. Uh, and how to give us, he's given us a lot to think about socially, psychologically, and uh, even personally. 
Um, I should also say that, uh, I mean, my own training is a, as a philosopher, so my comments will come from that thing. It's also, this book is incredibly readable. If you are at all intrigued with this, go pick this book up because it's very rare to find a philosophy book this readable. Uh, I could give it to my students. Uh, I could give it to my students to read, so if they can read it, and they're millennials. Okay? Uh, I encourage you to check this out. Okay, so my question is this, and, and correct me, I mean, maybe maybe your response to my comments is a bit flat-footed, but, but uh, let's see here. So, my question is, what is it to have a good character? That's an interesting question I have at the end of this talk. What is it to have a good character? And is it important to me at all? Okay. What do I mean by that? So uh, Miller has helped us see that the way to think about a good character is as the disposition to do morally as evil acts. I like that description. Okay. So we might think, if a person has a good character, then she will do morally as evil acts. That makes sense. Okay. The fascinating social science studies reveal that people don't always do morally good acts, okay? So they seem to be influenced people, I mean, and this is something I've personally been really fascinated with, this gap between how good other people think they are and how good they really are. It's something I've observed in others, okay? So, uh, people seem to be influenced by factors both internal and external to do acts that are not morally evident. Fortunately, the social science experiments also show us that having a good moral role model being educated about character are promising strategies for bridging the character gap. That's very exciting. And how do we know that there are good strategies for bridging the character gap? Because having a role model or having some education causes them to do morally admirable acts. So if a person, so we might think this, if a person has a role model or some education about character, then she will do morally admirable acts or more morally admirable acts. In other words, this having a role model and having educations are good for getting people to do these morally admirable Acts. So one approach, and I think one uh, you know Miller has recommended to us, is that we should give people moral role models and education to encourage them to do morally admirable acts. Uh, and we have good evidence to think that this will be helpful. Now this brings me to my key question: Are we to infer that giving people role models and moral education will give them a good character? We know that it will cause them to do morally admirable acts. Are we also supposed to think, or should we think, that that will give them a good character? So one response to that question, well, yes, obviously, uh, giving you know, people a role model, model will give them, help them have a good character. So I have two, two responses to that, to that action, to that response. Uh, I have two personal responses to that answer, uh, the two halves of me. So the pedantic philosopher half of me, okay, is worried about the fact that we're approaching a fallacy known as affirming the consequent. To have identified two causes that lead to the same effect, and then to operationalize the second cause in the hopes that it brings about the first cause is a worry. Okay? So consider the following example. Moments of great joy cause my mother to cry. As it happens, when I am mean to my sister, it also causes my mother to cry. Okay? Clearly, it would be deeply misguided for me to be mean to my sister in order to make my mother cry in the hopes that it would also bring her great joy. So if we know that, so I'll walk you through it. Okay, so, so if we know that giving people a moral role model will cause them to do morally admirable acts, and that having a good character will cause them to do morally admirable acts, can we be sure that giving them a good moral model will give them a good character. Okay. So the other half of me, which unfortunately is also a pedantic philosopher, two halves of me, the whole thing, um, is worried less about that fallacy. It is more concerned about the implication that good actions are the only thing that we're really concerned about. That maybe all the all that we're really concerned about about having a good character is promoting good actions. I fear that we're on the verge of saying that being virtuous or having a good character just mean to do, means to do a set of good acts. And perhaps if you hear me say that, you're inclined to say, and what would be wrong with that? We set out to study character. We learned how to foster good acts in people. Isn't that good? Yeah. We even found out how to significantly increase, significantly increase the percentage of good acts in a person's life. But to this I say that if our goal is to cause people to do morally admirable acts, if that's really our aim, then why would we prefer one approach to another? Why would we prefer giving people a role model to 
uh, giving them education or even endorsing something like Christianity. And what happens when the good people at Merck come together and create good exotrope? Okay? The pill that will cause people to do good acts. If that's more effective than either Christianity or, or moral education or giving them a moral model, is that really what we want? Would that make us happy? Could we take character in the form of a pill and would we, would we be happy about that? Those are my worries there. And uh, hopefully you can set me, set me up. <laughs> <laughs> So maybe I'll take just a few minutes, and then sure. we'll, we'll go into the Q&A. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah, right your spot. Great. Uh, so thank you both. Excellent. Uh, excellent comments. I should say they didn't have an opportunity to read that paper ahead of time and prepare their comments. So they were preparing their comments on the basis of the book and what they wrote today. So uh, really quite an incredible job. Uh, so thank right. you both for taking the time. Thank you. Uh, there's lots here to talk about that I don't want to go on too long because I don't want to get the audience engagement as well. Maybe I'll just uh, kind of look over my notes and recreate some responses to the main points that were raised. So, uh, first of all, I uh, really want to agree that it's not all about the situation, that the person matters as well. Uh, so, to bring out uh, a theme in my writings that didn't come up here too much, I don't think that everyone's character is the same as being, and is not virtuous. It's going to be, in uh, my way of thinking, a bell-shaped curve where there's a kind of spectrum of people, and most people are in what I call a murky middle of the character that's a kind of mixed bag. And some people, a small number of people, have a quite excellent character. Those are gonna be the role models, of course. Uh, or they could serve as role models. And there are going to be other people who have quite the formal character. And we can come up with plenty of examples of those too. We can look to the 20th century to find our favorite examples like Hitler, Stalin, Pol Pot, and the like. So uh, even though the situation is important, it's not the only thing, the person matters as well. And we get individual differences in people's character, whereby in a given situation, some people will behave one way, and other people will not behave that way. Uh, so they'll behave the opposite way. You can see that in some of the studies I looked at here. So even though it's true that most people did not help in the 1969 study, 7% did help. So there's some differentiation there. In the cheating uh, study, it was uh, 14 on average problems correct. But that was because everyone said they got 14. That was the average. There was a distribution of people saying they got this, 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 and this. So I think personality definitely matters. Character definitely matters. Uh, as well as situations, and there's a bell curve uh, overall. That um, also helps me remind uh, or bring to the uh, bring out something that was not very explicit, which is that I don't think the correct position to adopt is that most people are vicious. So I just said lack of virtue here. I also think uh, it's uh, equally true that most people are not vicious either. Most people don't have the virtues, most people don't have the vice either. And so to, to not think about another thing from the comments, the research on empathy is extremely helpful in this regard to illustrate some positive aspects of our characters. So it's not just, you know, oh, we're, we don't help, we cheat, uh, we're cruel, we're, you know, uh, you know, liars, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. No, when you actually look at the research, you can find plenty of studies which give us a uh, more positive impression of how people are. So to peek back in a little bit more, take the empathy. So let's briefly mention how there's this link between empathy and helping. So for 40 years now, we've known that when you induce empathy in participants in the lab, they're much more likely to help on a variety of helping tasks than our control participants. That's great, that's really interesting and, and important to know. Furthermore, we now have good reason to think that the underlying motivation behind that helping is selfless, it's altruistic. So empathy not only increases helping, it increases helping for the right kind of reasons, virtuous reasons, selfless reasons. That's incredible. So that also is evidence of lack of vice. 
But it has to be put side by side with other results which were not so encouraging, like the group effect research, or like the Milgram shock experiments, or like other studies which found people not doing helpful actions when they had perfect opportunity to do helpful actions. So the way I put all these pieces together is to come to the conclusion that most people don't have the virtues, I already said that, but also most people don't have the vices either. The moral vices like cruelty, cowardice, or dishonesty. Instead, our character is very much a mixed bag of some good elements and some bad elements, too. Hopefully that makes sense, and uh, I'm sorry I didn't explain that very much, explore that very much in the, in the presentation today. So uh, having said that, I entirely agree, perspective taking is really important, and it's a, another avenue to consider to foster virtue. Uh, so I, maybe it deserves to be a, uh, another strategy, if you put it that way. Um, how can we foster in people an increasing willingness to take the perspective of others and try to see the world through their eyes, thereby hopefully fostering feelings of empathy in them for the suffering of other people? So that's a good question. Uh, that's, that's a question, right? Um, and it's a, I think it's a really uh, important question and a great avenue to pursue in, in growing uh, virtue uh, that I didn't explore very much. Reminding our value of us of our values is really important as well. So uh, let me see. Last thing uh, I'll, I'll comment on. There's so much to, to talk about here. Uh, I was happy to see that um, this idea of goal versus byproduct seems to have some empirical support to it. That um, the goal needn't be trying to improve our character or to flourish or to have what Aristotle called eudaimonia, but that in doing virtuous actions, we can, as a byproduct, grow in these areas too. So doing the right thing for the right reasons can have really good byproduct side effects, like flourishing, right? um, and like uh, increased meaning and purpose, and increased subjective well-being, and subjective happiness in our lives. That's great, that's really encouraging to hear. Um, but we don't want to fall into the trap of making those things the goal. Because if we make those things the goal, uh, then it becomes egoistic, it's all about ourselves, we won't grow in virtue, and we won't be doing virtuous things in the process. Uh, so, sorry I didn't uh, engage with everything, but that's, those are some initial, initial responses. Um, to the pedantic philosopher, uh, 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 I, I like that. You know, I like the pedantic philosopher, I'm a pedantic philosopher. Um, so thank you for your comments as well. Quick clarification uh, initially. So what is it to have a good character? Who uh, said to, that disposition to have morally, or disposition to do morally good actions? Well, we saw that that's part of what it is to have a good character, but I really want to emphasize it's only part of it. It's also a disposition to do morally good actions for the right reasons or motives. That's really essential as well. So merely uh, exhibiting a pattern of consistent good behavior is not enough for being a good person. And I, I, I tried to, to uh, emphasize that in the beginning of the talk with a compassion example and those motivations which look like they're not really compatible with compassion. So whether that you know, helps or not, I just want to make it good clear that that's how I'm thinking about good character. Uh, good acts are only one part of the larger puzzle. Now, um, on the strategies and the pedantic point about the firm and the consequent, um, I think I need to talk to you more about that. Um, so I, I, need to, I need you to, to walk me through that. I'm just being uh, dense and slow. So I really am worried about that, and I, I, or we can talk about it in the Q&A uh, to help me understand more. What I will say is I don't see these strategies, the two secular strategies or the other ones I talk about in the book, as uh, I'll emphasize this. I don't see them as exclusive. You can uh, employ one if you want, so you can employ more than one. They're not incompatible with each other. In fact, I think it would be great to combine them and use as many strategies as one can to try and grow in virtue. And if you're religious, incorporate some religious strategies in there too. Uh, but we need a lot of help. So let's make, it help, make use of all the resources we can get to help us out in that process. Um, so, 
Are there, um, what, and then the question was raised, why choose one of them over another? Well, first of all, I, 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 maybe we don't have to choose, but of course time is limited and resources are limited, so we may have to, to make a choice. I would want to know which ones are more effective than others, and we want to choose maybe based on the effectiveness. I would also want to know about my own situation, a person's situation, what's more available or uh, uh, kind of more conducive to their situation, might be more, easier for them to adopt personally. But if it came down to something like the pill, um, you know, science fiction, now philosophers like to do science fiction, engage in these imaginary scenarios. What if there was a pill that we could take that would transform our character just like that? Me going from not very good character to great character. <clears throat> would people take it? That's an empirical question. Should people take it? That's another good question. <clears throat> On the should question, oh, and, and uh, uh, the third question, should we give it to other people? Should I give it to my children, for example? I've got young children. Should I, should I just milk it along? Should I give it to my young children? Maybe we solve a lot of problems, right? It might have a lot easier. You know, that don't have to worry about that uh, messy room anymore, or that back talking, whatever, whatever it is. Um, I think I want to pose those questions as questions for the audience and hear what you have to say. Um, initially, I'm Boy, I, I don't know, I, I, I'd, be, I'd be tempted to take that pill. Um, I have to see what other people are doing, maybe that matters too. Would I be uh, more liable to be taken advantage of by others? Because now I'm such a trust, trusting and honest person, and now I'm going to be you know, easy easy prey for the, for the manipulator and the deceiver. I have to be able to think, take that into account. But what if we all took the pill at the same time? Maybe, why not? Okay, I'll leave it at that. Let's go. Let's hear from everyone else.